We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. We have no the choice. The sun has risen on an independent, united kingdom. There's four or five thousand data points on every adult in the United States. An extremely jealous and resentful employee. You have been attacked. Your credibility has been attacked. Christopher Wiley spent his early years confined to a wheelchair. Unable to fit in, he'd often hide away in the school's computer lab. To expand his comfort zone beyond a single room, his parents enrolled him into Pearson College, a school renowned for its inclusivity. It was there that Wiley was exposed to a melting pot of cultures and ideologies, becoming friends with an orphan who survived the Rwandan genocide, and spending mealtimes listening to Israeli and Palestinian kids discuss the future of their homelands. With his worldview broadening, he began skipping classes just to attend Parliament, where instead of being told what to do and how to think, he felt free to express himself. His passion was recognised, and he was rewarded with a job where he would provide tech help for the Canadian Liberal Party. Growing up, Wiley was drawn to places where he felt welcome, naturally developing a passion for both technology and politics. So when Obama's team found huge success with their new approach of digital campaigning and data-driven decision-making, it only made sense for the Canadian Liberals to send Wiley over to learn about their strategies. Like any other campaign, Obama's success was down to targeting the right voters and sending the right message. What separated them from the rest was the Voter Activation Network. Van is a piece of software that stores large amounts of voter data, so campaigns across America can then use it to identify potential supporters and track their progress in voter engagement. They were streamlining their campaign and gaining a huge upper hand on their conservative counterparts. Wally was mesmerized, clearly witnessing the future of political campaigning. So he sat down to educate himself on the world of data. Wiley tried bringing the van system back to Canada, but he ran into problems. Data acquisition would be expensive, and since Van was built for America's two-party system, it was unclear if it would work for Canada's five-party system. It was a financial risk that the Liberal Party were unwilling to take. Convinced that it would work, Wiley contacted Obama's lead man in voter targeting, who helped him create a model allowing for more than two parties. And it was a huge success. Conversion rates were much higher, but when the party found out, they objected. They wanted the results of Obama's campaign, but for some reason, were unwilling to adopt a new way of doing things. Wiley later found that the party's advertising, consulting, and printing contracts were given to friends and family of senior party members. His new data-driven system was rejected as it threatened their culture of backhanders. A bit fed up that his hard work amounted to nothing, Wiley moved to the UK in pursuit of a law degree. But only days after moving, he received a call from the Lib Dem political party, asking him to come and educate them on Van. Impressed with what he had to say, he was offered a job to implement his voter targeting strategy on their behalf. Having accepted the job, Wiley faced a mountain of work. The Lib Dem's data stores were incomplete and outdated, meaning he would have to contact county councils for their voter data, which came in all forms. Excel, PDF, even paper not yet digitized. Playing with the scraps of data coming in, Wiley found the voters of competing parties were much easier to predict and categorize. While Tory and Labour voters had broad stereotypes, the Lib Dem party seemed to attract all sorts of voters. At a loss, Wiley reached out to Brent Clickard, a Cambridge professor with a PhD in psychology. Clickard suggested that instead of age, race, or social class, Wiley should try categorize the voters on their personality type. And it worked. While they didn't share skin color or social status, the Lib Dem voters could be grouped by their openness and their lack of agreeableness. It was a success for his methodology, but the results were not pretty. Wiley reported back to the party with bad news. The data was showing their voters' distaste for compromise, and yet the party was in coalition with the Tories. They were acting against their votership's core values. It was only a matter of time before they'd lose seats in Parliament. Unable to accept his data science as anything more than insulting, he was dismissed as pessimistic and cynical. In the years following his dismissal, 
the party would hit an all-time low in the polls, losing hundreds of seats and vindicating Wiley. SEL was a company contracted by militaries across the globe, contracted to identify and target key groups of people in order to modify their behavior and achieve a desired outcome. For example, their contracts include mitigation of jihadist recruitment in Pakistan, as well as counter human trafficking in Latin America. A friend of Wiley's called him to tell about an opening at SEL. Sick of working in politics, he decided to apply for something new. After signing a non-disclosure agreement, Alexander Nix, the SEL director conducting the interview, proudly showed off documents of their past operations. Wiley voiced his honest reaction. This could all be done so much better. Nix wasn't a fan of criticism, but he bottled up his rage and the interview ended. Once he calmed down, Nix followed up with a phone call, wondering what he was doing wrong and how he could fix it. Satisfied with his answer, Wiley was given a three month contract and the keys to Nix's filing cabinet. Wiley proposed an evolved system, similar to Van, create a detailed dataset of the client's target, then using algorithms, identify key groups of people and exploit them. Wiley spent his first few months working with Tadas Jussicus, a Cambridge student modeling and predicting the behavior of roundworms as part of his PhD. His prediction model was perfect for what Wiley was proposing. If they could harvest a rich data set of a given group, they could simply substitute out worms for humans. Then with a deeper understanding and an ability to predict behavior, they could optimize their efforts in changing that behavior. To get started, they would need a testing ground and opportunity struck. Trinidad and Tobago had contracted SEL to reduce their crime rate. And with a diverse population of 1.3 million, it was the perfect place to start. Instead of trawling through scrappy data and interviewing locals, the team was given declassified access to the country's raw census data, as well as permission to tap into their telecoms. A total invasion of privacy, SEL could now pick any person from the census data and using their IP address, watch them as they browsed the web. Wiley's core values were being tested, but if this system could ultimately de-radicalize the world, then surely it was for the greater good. His values were pushed even further when they were approached by an African nation looking for assistance in politics. While that's standard practice for SEL, the contract was to be paid out of the nation's health budget. Wiley suggested it was unlawful, and Nix's response, you can't expect anything legal from these people. It's Africa. As the millions poured in at the expense of sick and dying Africans, Wiley removed himself from the project, just in time for a new project. Breitbart.com was an alt-right media outlet that was used to challenge the culture of progressive ideology. That's how its co-founder Steve Bannon described it. From his work at Breitbart, Bannon understood the potential power of emotionally charged groups of people. He met with Nix to discuss a partnership, but Nix was a salesman who didn't quite understand what he was selling. So Wiley was tagged in. Bannon wanted to change the culture of America, but when Wiley asked him to define culture, he couldn't. Wiley takes a loose approach in explaining what culture is and how you would change it. Taking Italians as an example, it's generally accepted that they're a nation of extroverted people. If you wanted to alter that trait, you'd need to identify individuals who rank highest in extroversion. Then by using psychology to find flaws in how that individual thinks, you can gradually chip away at them, disrupting and rewriting their way of thinking and ultimately their behavior. Scale up that process, and for better or worse, you're changing a nation's culture. What do you mean finding flaws in how people think? Let's say you ask a stranger if they're happy and they say yes. If you were to take that same stranger and start by asking if any of their childhood friends are more successful than them, then follow up with the same question about their happiness, they become a lot more reluctant to say yes. Their life hasn't changed at all, but by pulling negative thoughts to the forefront of the mind, you momentarily change people's perception. 
you then repeat that process until that momentary change becomes their new way of thinking. It was psychological warfare and Bannon was sold, but he wasn't the one fronting the money. His friend and billionaire, Robert Mercer, wanted SEL's expertise to predict moves in the financial market. With potential for significant investment, Wiley and his team got to work fast on a proof of concept. They began in the state of Virginia, speaking with locals to gain a rough understanding of the culture. Later moving on to structured focus groups, where they heard a lot about Ken Cuccinelli, a highly conservative candidate whose policies targeted the gay community as he aimed to claim votes from evangelical Christians. But he took it too far. He pushed hard for a law banning sodomy. Even the most conservative voters were made to feel uncomfortable. Yes, they saw the gays as ungodly, but associating acts of intimacy with this politician was incredibly off-putting. The data Wiley's team were harvesting suggested that Republicans hated unpredictability. So they put their findings to the test. Cuccinelli's new message, you might not agree with me, but at least you know where I stand. It outperformed all other messaging, despite meaning absolutely nothing. Playing around with what they had, the team were quickly learning more creative ways to manipulate outcomes based on people's innermost traits, finding different flaws in different ways of thinking and how best to exploit them. Despite Nick's rushing the boys to get the report done, it was good enough to earn the firm a meeting with Mercer. Cut to dinner. Nix was giving his best sales pitch, waffling on as though he'd never read the report. Seeing their wealthy client losing interest, Wiley interrupted with an actual thorough understanding of the project. Describing details of a system that allowed them to see into and control the future of America's culture. Impressed and excited, Mercer signed a check for 20 million. His investment would fund an offshoot of SEL, the goal of which was to create a detailed data set accounting for every individual in the USA. A simulated society where you could test different conditions until they produce your desired results. Then you can replicate those conditions in the real world. That offshoot was Cambridge Analytica. Around the same time, researchers at Cambridge University were finding strong correlation between a social media user's activities and their psychometric profile. Put simply, your likes and shares are closely linked to your personality. One of these researchers, Dr. Kogan the Moldovan, was introduced to SEL, and it didn't take long for them to recognize his value. Kogan was initially signed to the Trinidad and Tobago pilot project, but was far more interested in what was going on in America. While CA were successfully harvesting and modeling data in Virginia, scaling up to the entire population of America would be no easy task. But Kogan had a solution. He introduced two of his associates, Kolinsky and Stilwell, who had created an app called My Personality, where a user could fill out a survey. Then by linking their Facebook account, they could find out their personality type. But in linking a Facebook account, not only is a user giving access to all of their personal data, they're also providing the app with the personal data of everyone in their friends list. So even if you've never heard of this app, it could know everything about you. All thanks to your Uncle Steve, who's just shared he's an ESFJ. With each user having 300 friends on average, 1,000 downloads of the My Personality app translates to a data set of 300,000 individuals. In 2015, a study showed that with just 10 likes, an algorithm could predict a user's behavior more accurately than their coworkers. After 300 likes, it'd be more accurate than your spouse. Since likes aren't swayed by the context of a relationship, they see the real you. That's bad news for you, but it's great news for CA. No more talking to locals about their worldview. Just make an app, get a million people to link their Facebook account, and suddenly you're looking at the intimate data of 300 million people. Data that can tell you more about each individual than their closest loved ones ever could. Kogan let slip about Mercer's 20 mil investment, and naturally, Stilwell and Kalinsky wanted a cut, seeking half a million each and 50% in royalties. 
Nyx, who is essentially a human Mr. Krabs, Hello, I like money. drop them then and there, instead offering Kogan a measly 10 grand and personal access to the dataset if he could undertake the task on his own. So Kogan turned to MTurk, an Amazon website where you can pay a large number of people to complete small tasks. If they completed a personality test, they'd earn a couple dollars, but payment was withheld until the user linked their Facebook account to Kogan's app. CA threw 100 grand into MTurk and watched as their dataset populated itself. Hundreds of thousands of people unknowingly trading their entire identity for a couple dollars. When Bannon visited the office to see how the team was getting on, he was seated in front of a screen and asked to pick a name and US state at random. Selecting one of the results returned everything there is to know about the individual. Here's her face, her kids, her place of work, the car she drives, her voting history, and a satellite image of her house. Nix, pretending to be a researcher, called the woman to confirm all the obscure details listed in front of them. Bannon couldn't contain his excitement. How many of these do we have? The answer was millions. And that was just the beginning. After two months, the dataset contained everything there was to know about 87 million Americans. As the dataset grew, so did CA. More staff were needed to service the ever-growing amount of projects. Wiley's influence was diluting. Now whenever he questioned the ethics of a project, he was laughed at and reminded, that's just how the world works. The data showed that a lot of Americans felt closeted, inhibited from being their true selves. Take the elderly straight white male as an example. He's unable to say or do as he pleases anymore. He can't flirt with his secretary or make jokes about minorities without fear of consequence. While objectively a uh, racist or misogynist, he's subjectively oppressed. CA continued to highlight these darker, more vulnerable parts of the American psyche, making it extremely easy to identify people with neurotic, narcissistic, or other exploitable traits. And with their targets now identified, it was time to strike. They started by sending out handcrafted narratives in the form of Facebook groups, ads, and articles. The old man would see posts like, America was the land of the free. Now you can't even mispronounce a foreign name without being canceled. Religious types would see, if minorities are suffering, then it must be a part of God's plan. The underprivileged were shown pages like People of Walmart, designed to make them believe that the liberal elites were undermining their place in society. All over America, social feeds were tailored to trigger an emotional response, to obscure rationale and bring out the worst in people. These suggestions became beliefs, beliefs became identity, then any counter-narrative or argument became an attack not only on your freedom of speech, but now on your identity as a whole. When these Facebook groups grew large enough, CA arranged physical meetups, often in small coffee shops, to make the group seem bigger. Once a county had a large enough group of mobilized targets, it was time to introduce them to another county of mobilized targets. Do that a few more times, and you have yourself a statewide movement of neurotic citizens preaching their handcrafted conspiracies. The more time he spent at CA, playing God with unsuspecting targets, Wiley felt as though he was losing touch with reality. A project cropped up with the sole intention of demotivating black people from voting entirely. Wiley flagged this as illegal and contacted the firm's lawyers, but there was no response. Wiley was nearing his breaking point, filled with shame realizing what he helped create. Then one day, a coworker stumbled into work late after his trip to Africa. Nick screamed at him for being late, despite his clear and severe signs of what they later learned to be malaria. Other co-workers urged him to go to hospital, but before he could get there, he fell down the stairs and cracked his head open. Nick returned from the hospital after visiting the comatose employee, inquiring how long he had to keep paying him. That was Wiley's last straw. Wiley escaped back to Canada, 
content to resume his work with regular old politics. But before he could catch his breath, he was asked to join Vote Leave, the leading campaign for Britain to leave the EU. With obligations in Canada, Wiley turned down the offer, but as a courtesy, he outlined some basic data strategies and also recommended his friend Sani for an internship. Sani was young, gay, and Pakistani, a valuable asset for the campaign as he could help swing liberal voters towards their conservative cause. He started Believe, a progressive sub-campaign which targeted people of color. Despite their best efforts, the Vote Leave campaign needed to utilize data science in order to stay competitive. And while CA's data capabilities were unparalleled, they were already assisting another Brexit campaign. Legally, CA couldn't assist with multiple campaign groups, but with its convoluted setup, it had what essentially were offshore companies to bypass laws just like this. As a result, VoteLeave turned to AIQ, a company The Guardian refers to as SEL's Canadian branch. They handed over 2.7 million pounds, hitting their spending limit of 7 million. Sani was commended on Believe's performance and was offered investment for his sub-campaign if he authorized a couple invoices. After putting pen to paper, he was left disappointed. The 700,000 investment bypassed Believe and was directly wired to AIQ, leaving Sani not only disappointed, but now legally responsible for breaching the campaign's spending limit. As Vote Leave implemented Wiley's brainchild without his knowledge, he along with two others were invited to meet Trump. Wiley declined as those who contacted him didn't seem at all informed on what exactly he did. One of the two men who attended the meeting rang Wiley laughing. Trump was running for president. Laughter stopped when the three men were sued by CA. Apparently Trump was a client they kept off the record and they didn't like the idea of old staff stealing their business. CA were willing to drop the lawsuit if Wiley agreed to never work with Data again. Wiley, of course, refused. Instead, he agreed to a settlement that banned him from ever speaking about what he witnessed at CA. As Wiley continued his mundane work in Canada, Trump's campaign grew from nonsense to well-targeted messaging. Build that wall, and drain, drain the, the swamp, swamp, as well as other outrageous phrases were all too familiar to Wiley, who had helped create and refine them to trigger frustrated Americans. On the surface, Trump's campaign seemed to be chaotic, but in reality, every move was a well-calculated, data-driven decision. The overarching goal of CA was to segregate people online based on their personalities. Then by targeting each group with messaging designed to exploit their ways of thinking, they could turn these groups against each other. If you destroy the mutual experience of humanity, then control the information environment so that everything boils down to us versus them, you become capable of rewriting reality. Within six months, Wiley watched as Britain voted to leave the EU and Trump was appointed President of the United States. With the world on fire, Wiley felt tremendous guilt having lit the match. In order to atone for his contribution, he had to let the public know exactly what was going on. So when the Guardian approached him to share his story, he was on board, but only if the New York Times published it as well. That way, America's First Amendment protected the story from litigation. He then partnered with Tamsin Allen, a lawyer who specializes in privacy and defamation. Since he was under NDA, any information he shared must be deemed to reveal illegal acts. So together they worked tirelessly to organize evidence that fit that quota. They spoke to Sani, who had not yet understood the implication of Believe's role in breaking the law. He agreed to help providing evidence of Vote Leave's overspending and destruction of evidence. Next, they targeted Nix, contacting Channel 4 News, who agreed to carry out an undercover sting operation. Renting out an entire restaurant, they employed an actor to play the role of Ranjan, a wealthy Sri Lankan looking to get involved in politics. 
Nix gave his best sales pitch, describing details of what they have done and can do to ensure Ranjan's success. When Wiley saw the footage, he informed the Information Commissioner's Office that CA were still operating. He provided the ICO with all of the evidence he had, who then in turn handed it to the National Crime Agency. A week before publication, those mentioned were given the right to reply. Facebook were furious and replied by demanding Wiley hand over all devices, citing the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. When he ignored their fear tactics, they then threatened to sue The Guardian. When that was ignored, they banned Wiley off Facebook's site in an attempt to undermine the story. But Facebook wasn't alone in responding to their right to reply. Stephen Parkinson of the Vote Leave campaign tried to beat the headlines by announcing his secret love affair with Sani. In an attempt to reduce Sani's input to just a lover's quarrel, Parkinson outed him to the world, endangering his family back in Pakistan, where homosexuality can earn you a life sentence. Despite attempts to undermine or cover up the publication, several agencies across the world launched investigations into Cambridge Analytica, SEL, and Facebook. The FTC, FBI, DOJ, ICO, European Parliament, as well as agencies from Canada, Australia, Brazil, and India, all looking to uncover the extent of data misuse. In May of 2018, Cambridge Analytica filed for bankruptcy, and SEL was shut down. Nix was banned from serving as a company director for seven years. The FTC sued Facebook for $5 billion in 2019, and demanded a more robust privacy structure be put in place. In 2022, Meta, formerly Facebook, settled a lawsuit agreeing to pay out $725 million to those whose data was abused. And while their stock price took a heavy hit, they're currently trending towards an all-time high. When the dust settled, nobody seemed to really suffer any consequences for their actions, except for one person. In the present day, Wiley's apartment is full of devices, all smashed and acid bleached to remove any data. His TV's been ripped from the wall, since it's more likely to be watching him than the other way around. He walks around with a personal VPN to be untraceable, as well as a portable panic button that alerts the National Crime Agency when pressed. Next to his bed is a nightstand, where he keeps his phone when he's not using it. Its drawers are lined with a material that blocks electronic signals from getting in or out. The measures taken are comparable to a paranoid man, but it's not considered paranoia when the threat is very much real. At the young age of 34, Wiley unveiled the exploitation of the public's data, giving up the ability to live a normal life to show us exactly how we're being targeted and why. But what can we do with the information he's given us? While deleting everything would take power back from those who control our data, it's ultimately an unreasonable suggestion. As Wiley learned the hard way, our digital lives and real lives are becoming more and more inseparable. We spend a large portion of our lives working, playing, socializing, and even dating online. To remove your digital identity from these apps, is to exclude yourself from a large portion of modern day society. Let's say you don't want to be a data point for the next Cambridge Analytica, but you also don't want to exile yourself from modern society. What can you do? My suggestion is to reduce your digital footprint. Minimize your online presence to only what you deem necessary. Delete profiles you don't use. Remove strangers from your list of friends, following and followers. Post less, share less, and like less. Secondly, do your best to not be emotionally disrupted by anything you see online. In an environment where engagement is prioritized over factual accuracy, everything is sensational. Whether something is true or not no longer matters. It's all designed to elicit a strong emotional response. If you can't minimize your time on the internet, Minimize your emotional investment, not only for your own sake, but for the good of everyone around you.